This meeting is being recorded. All right, uh, so we have people streaming in. We are now recording. We will begin promptly at uh, 8 o'clock. My name is Celio Barreto, and I'd love to introduce you now to the Photographic Historical Society of Canada's president, Mr. Clint Rihorio. Uh Clint? Thank you very much, Celio. Folks, welcome uh, tonight uh, to, this is a, a regular uh, event that we do uh, on the third Wednesday of every month. We, we are the PHSC, the Photographic Historic, Photographic Historical Society of Canada. Do visit us at www.phsc.ca. Uh, that's our website. It'll keep you informed on the programs that we hold every third Wednesday of every month. In addition, of course, when we're outside of this horrible thing called COVID, we hold fairs. We hold two fairs a year. What's a fair? Well, it's you come and sell, buy, trade cameras, photographs, photographic gear, you name it. If it's related to photography, you'll find it, find it there. You'll be able to trade it there. You'll be able to sell it there with some luck. We also hold at least two auctions a year. Uh, that's a good opportunity to acquire goodies at a good price. It's also a very good opportunity to liquidate things. You can sell stuff at auction uh, through the PHSC when the opportunity once presents itself. How do you keep in touch with us? Well, I've already mentioned the website, phsc.ca. Folks, at the very least, you can respond to us by going to the website and signing up for our email newsletter. Email newsletter comes out once a month. And we take a bit of a hiatus in the summertime, those editors hardworking editors, they need a couple of couple of months off to rejuvenate. It's a wild, fun email. Uh, it, it, there's something in there for everyone. It's, uh, it's, it's got facts, it's got humor, it's got some wonderful opinions, it's got a lot of research. You'll enjoy it, it's free. Send us your email, we do not sell your email, we don't give it away, we don't rent it. We guard it very, very jealously, actually. Folks, we would encourage you to become members of the Photographic and Historical Society of Canada. Cost is $35 if you're in Canada. You get a wonderful journal four times a year, produced super competently by our editors, David and Louise, who were just chiming in a few minutes ago. Uh, lots of great articles in there, um, facts, stories, hardware, images, anything and everything we encourage you to contribute. As a matter of fact, just in the last two weeks, I've spoken to uh, three different people who will be writing articles for us because they're good at it and they enjoy doing that sort of thing. Now, we, as part of our outreach to the community and, and, and to treat uh, uh, up and coming um, photo researchers, um, we, the PHSC, um, we, we sponsor a very nice award at Ryerson, uh, best thesis in the master's program, photo and film preservation and collection management. We like liaison with Ryerson. It's a good bunch. They've been producing brilliant researchers, people who have gone on to do uh, very impressive things. Brendan is only the most recent in a long line of uh, very, very qualified recipients of this prize. So as part of our program, we welcome him tonight. Um, you will see uh, a summarized version of his thesis in an upcoming journal. Yet another reason to sign up as a member, which is $35. Again, go to the website, fill out a membership form. Heck, you can even pay by PayPal, uh, check, you know, whatever. Um, and um, check out what's on the website. Check out the, uh, the the tab that leads to the old newsletters. You'll say, my goodness, that's a bunch of interesting stuff. That's enough. That's our commercial. I'm now going to throw it back to Celio, who is our omnicompetent program coordinator. Once a month, he organizes people to come out and speak to our group. And he's batting a thousand. Um, it's interesting. It's very. Do join us uh, early and often. We have some very enjoyable banter sessions just before and after um, these uh, very uh, interesting.
interesting uh, presentation. So let me throw it back to you, Salio, to do the grand introductions. Oh. Sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you very much, Clint. Those are very kind words. Um, so uh, tonight it's my honor to be introducing Mr. Brandon Long, a recent graduate from the Rogers University Film and Photographic Preservation and Collections Management Program here in Toronto. Uh, Brandon Long, uh, he, him, uh, is a writer and photographer whose chosen medium is film. Uh, film photography. Uh, he photographs the everyday world around him, though many of his photographs depict candid um, <clears throat> events and the urban environment. They express an interest beyond street photography, namely in public space, history, and identity. In his research and writing, he is interested in the intersections between images and text and Asian uh, disparatic culture, uh, diasporic. Diasporic. I'm sorry. Uh, without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Uh, Brandon Lung. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Celio. Yeah, and thank you for waiting, everybody. I'm really, really glad to be able to do this. I, it's been a while since I had um, I finished my thesis about um, about late 2020, and of course, a lot of the stuff I'd researched been and on my, been on my mind continuously. But um, at the same time, uh, life has to move on. Sometimes you have to deal with other things. So it's really great. To, it was really great to be able to revisit this. I'm really happy to um, um, bring this uh, bring this uh, bring my work. To more people and again like i said i know there are a lot of people from the chinese canadian community here and i you see some names that were the people who were um present during the time um time period that i'll be talking about so i'm really thankful for everyone being here um and participating in this talk and i really hope um my research does some Justice to the community and to Jim Wong, who Jim Wong Chu was as well. So I'm going to share my presentation now. So hopefully you can um, see my presentation here and I'll start it. Okay, so as uh, Clint and Celio were saying, I, I graduated from the um, um, sorry, I graduated from Ryerson's uh, FPPCM program um, near the end of 2020. It's a photographic preservation program. And as part of my um, research um, for my second year, I had to create a thesis project. So I did it on uh, my thesis is called Chinatown Forever Changing, Jim Wong Chu's Pender East, um, which is a photographic um, album with written poetry and as well as you'll see very soon. So first, I'd like to acknowledge uh, that I'm speaking from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Salatooth nations. And I would encourage everybody here to also learn about what lives they, uh, what lands they live on and occupy. Um, nativeland.ca, which I have here uh, on the side here is a good resource for that. Um, I, would, I would also like to use this time to acknowledge that research is never a singular process, of course, uh, but is extremely collaborative. And I'd like to thank the many people who helped me produce my thesis. So first, Dr. Lily Cho and Dr. Marta Brown, who acted as my thesis readers. Uh, Christina Laszlo, archivist at UBC's uh, Rare Books and Special Collections, uh, Marlene Enns, and everybody who agreed to be interviewed as part of my research. I know some of you are here, so thank you so much. Again, I'm really glad you're here to hear, the, um, um, hear my work. Um, as well, of course, I thank uh, my family for their support over all these years. 
and again to the Photographic Historical Society for the opportunity to both uh, present my work in this uh, forum and to uh, have an edited version of my thesis published in their journal. So uh, this wouldn't have been possible without everybody's help and generosity, of course. I'll take a sip of water. Okay, so first I'd like to talk about Jim Wong Chu himself and about his life and the many experiences um, he went through throughout his life, especially since um, I believe they very well align with what we might call the Asian Canadian experience, uh, which of course uh, I argued in my paper played a large part in how his album Pender East was created. So Jim Wong Chu was born in Hong Kong in 1949. Um, in 1953, uh, at a very young age still, his parents sent him to Vancouver, uh, where he was raised by his aunt, um, whom he was actually told was his mother. Um, in this sense, Jim Wong Chu became what is now called a paper son, as you can see from the headline of this article here. Um, and so, um, this was because he immigrated uh, basically with the identity of another child who had um, fled from the People's Republic of China to Hong Kong after Mao uh, took over in China with the help of one of his aunts, uh, though the child died during that trip. So um, Jim basically used this child's identity to help him immigrate to Canada, which was a big practice around this time in the 50s, um, especially since uh, Canada's immigration policies for Chinese individuals wasn't as restrictive as it had been, but it was still somewhat restrictive, um, especially if you didn't have close relatives or close immediate family already living in Canada at the time. So in, the, he, so in this case, this made him what is now called a paper son. Um, so his, this is the reason for why his name, uh, the name he went by was Wong Chu. Wong was the name of the child of the identity he had taken. Chu was his family's real family name. And his English name, Jim, was actually given to him later uh, by a teacher when he was in Vancouver. And it was only till very much later in his life that he would you know, learn about these true, the true family origins he came from, and then he would take on the hyphenated name of Jim Wong Chu. Uh, so while he was in Vancouver as a young child at this time, um, he um, eventually, he, his aunt and uncle were worried that he would be found out by immigration um, individuals as being, uh, in the immigration officers as being under a, uh, you know, false name, as it were. And so by 1957, they actually sent him back to uh, Hong Kong, and where he uh, re-met his father again for the first time in four years. And then by the early 1960s, he returned to Canada. Um, and at that point, he, um, he would go between the interior of BC and between uh, Chicago as well, between different family members, family friends. And then about 1965, um, he resettled back in Vancouver. And he also began um, volunteering with Chinese seniors in Vancouver's Chinatown, helping them with errands and practicing um, his Cantonese language skills, basically. Um, uh, there are a lot of organizations still around in Vancouver's Chinatown today that, um, that volunteer with Chinese seniors, um, which form a lot, large part of the population of the Chinatown here. And he would go on to recount hearing stories about all the um, injustices that these, you know, this elder population of Chinese Canadians uh, faced while they had been in Canada. And these were a lot of stories he began to relate to, of course. And so around the same time, he was often visiting uh, San Francisco um, with family, friends, and this, uh, you know, introduced him to a lot of the activism that was happening in the Asian American community at the time. Um, uh, Asian American activism, having started a little bit earlier than uh, uh, what was happening in Canada, and he was very inspired by this, and he wanted to bring this uh, activism back to Vancouver, of course. So it's from this point that um, he would begin a lot of the things he's most well known for. He would go on to be a, a founding member of several Asian Canadian cultural organizations in Vancouver, 
um, including the very well-known radio program Pender Guy and the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop. Uh, the Writers Workshop still uh, runs to this day. And so he began taking photographs um, in the early 1970s, um, saying it was part of it, you know, his search for identity, his Chinese Canadian identity, while um, he was often in Chinatown. And so the album I'll be talking about, Pender East, was created as his final thesis project for his studies at the Vancouver School of Art, now known as Emily Carr University, um, in which he studied photography from 1975 to 1981. And after graduating from art school, he decided to focus on writing. Um, from 1985 to 1987, he attended UBC for creative writing. And that really became what he was really well known for, um, his writing work. His photography, interestingly, as amazing as the photographs are, really um, is really just this early period when he was doing it before he switched to writing. So these are this is a picture of this uh, the poetry collection, Chinatown Ghosts, um, first published 1986. It was recently republished in 2018. And um, so you should be able to find this copy uh, of Chinatown Ghosts around in a local library or whatnot. It's a really great collection of poems. This new edition has some of the photographs I'll be talking about in it too. So that's really great to have that together. Uh, I'm going to, I just realized, just going to, he shares, there's a little reshare my screen. There is a, just want to make sure this next part works very well. Okay. So I'd like to um, play this video here um, with Jim. Um, to end this part about his biography. It's a really great video. I think it really shows up the kind of person he was and um, what he was interested in and the kind of themes he was interested in, the themes that were very much um, uh, played a part in the analysis you know, I take for the album later on. So hopefully people can hear this. <laughs> You're constantly being kind of, there are points in your life that there's always attention drawn to you, that you are different. Yet, what does that mean? You know, how different are you? And I think cultural identity kind of evolves out there. And for me, it was the same because I lived in a small town most of my time when I was younger. And um, in small towns, you're picked on. You're picked on because you know, you're just different or whatever. And our family owned a Chinese cafe. And, you know, most of the uh, fellow students that I go to class with uh, after school, I'm waiting on tables. So I'm almost like a servant to some of these people. In some ways, you kind of feel the class difference and also the struggle of, of who you are in relation to everybody else around you. Back in those days, we're like during the hippie era in the 60s and 70s, consciousness was a very uh, prevalent word, community consciousness. And consciousness means that you're either conscious or you're unconscious. If you're unconscious, you don't know what's going on. You, you just live out your life and la la and so on. But once you're conscious, you can't go back. Once your eyes are open and you see what's around you, uh, you change because your focus change, and also um, the reason why I do things change. But a lot of people have, I, I found that a lot among Asians in the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of anger, pent up anger inside. And the anger was uh, either self-inflicted or else their family uh, pressured uh, certain ways of, of having to conform to a certain way in society or whatever it was. It created a certain amount of frustration and anger and manifest itself in different ways. And in my circumstance, I decided to uh, put it to good use.
Great. So I think I've, I thought it would be really great to bring his, um, unfortunately, Jim Wong, she's not with us anymore. And I thought it'd be really great. He was, he was a really great speaker and I thought it'd be really great to um, you know, bring his voice into this conversation. Me, there we go. So now I would like to talk about the album, which is at the center of my research, again, called Pender East. Um, so this album here, and this is the cover I'm showing everybody, it's held in the Jim Wong Chu Fonz, um, which is at the UBC Library's Rare Books and Special Collections. Um, so his Fonz, um, Fonz is an archival term, basically means a collection. So um, it's basically a collect, it's um, his collection of his, basically his uh, personal records, project records, notes for projects he did, his photographs, of course. So um, the album itself um, is about 58 pages in total. Each page is a photographic print in black and white or in photo speak, it's called a gelatin silver print. Um, about 43 of the pages are photographs that you're seeing flashing on the screen here. About 15 of the other prints are um, poetry. Um, each print, each print is about uh, 35 and a half by 28.8 centimeters, 11 by 14 inches. So it gives you the about the you imagine the size of it. It's not not particularly small and not too big as well. And it really showed the size really shows off the the detail of the photographs as well. So. I basically learned about Pender East uh, through a class visit um, that he did. Um, one of my undergraduate classes at UBC about archives, we visited rare books and special collections. Um, and we were talking about uh, Jim's materials. So our teacher invited him to come speak to us, which was, um, was a really great experience. And it was then that I found out about this album. He showed us uh, a copy of it basically that was it's very different from this one. It was more like a, a scrapbook almost with um, the photographs kind of pasted in onto the pages, um, the poetry kind of handwritten next to it. Um, so for my understanding of the album, for when I analyzed it in my paper, um, I basically gave it four distinct sections. Um, you know, these sections aren't specifically named in the album itself. They're um, they're ones I gave it, but when you flip through the album, you can see it was very deliberately put together. So the first section I called people and places, um, uh, which is basically a lot of portraits of people in Chinatown. And especially as you can see through here, it's not just the people themselves, but the you know, surrounding street or businesses around them. The next section I called political campaigning. Uh, basically, a lot of pictures of um, a political campaign happening in Chinatown around the time period um, and Chinese Canadian participation in it. Um, next section I call Chinese festivities, um, which shows um, participate uh, Chinese Canadians acting as participants um, and audience members to you know Chinese festivities or performances happening in Chinatown. And the final section I called community portraits. And this contained um, basically um, portraits of different community members in Chinatown at the time. And each of them basically were accompanied by a poetry or a text piece. So it was the part of the album which really gave the most con you know, direct context to uh, what the photographs were about. And so what I found was not just a collection of poems and documentary photographs of Vancouver's Chinatown in the 1970s, um, but really a really complex work that was, uh, that's deeply rooted in the Chinese Canadian experience and community. Um, and though the pictures, um, you know, you could say they look documentary, they look like street photography, they look like uh, photojournalists' pictures, um, what was important, um, as I wrote in my thesis, uh, was that though Jim Wong Chu's uh, photographic practice can be broadly related to documentary practices within the history of photography, uh, doing so would place his photographs in a context that they were not made for. Um, instead of a documentary standpoint, his photographs can be seen from the perspective of Asian Canadian cultural activism. Uh, Asian Canadian cultural activism 
activism is a term I take I took from this book on the right here, Voices Rising by Xiaoping Li, who is a professor at the Okanagan campus of UBC. Um, and so to give a short definition, she, divi she defines uh, Asian Canadian cultural activism as a discourse or a social cultural movement created and participated in by Asian Canadians who have attempted to affect the world through their cultural practices. So really the, the last sentence I have here can really be seeing the album from the perspective of Chinese Canadian history, from the history of Chinese immigration to the Canada, to the history of um, specifically here, Vancouver's Chinatown. So while um, what I delivered, you know, in the end of all my work was this paper I wrote and this, uh, what I'm showing here, this a very detailed spreadsheet um, about each page of the album. Uh, what really mattered to me, um, and of course how I even came to all this information and was able to do all this in the end, um, was by connecting Pender East to, you know, a real place and a real community. Uh, oftentimes, I feel like when we talk about photography, um, it gets too, you know, we talk a lot about how photo photographs are just representations of reality, of course. And of course, they are, you know, photographs are not, um, you know, as truthful as we might think they are. Um, but at the same time, you know, photographs are still so indebted to reality, you know, a, a photograph, um, you know, in the rawest way we think about it, you know, it's still coming from still taking a picture of a real place of something that actually happened in front of the camera. Um, um, and I think that's especially important when we're talking about an album uh, like Pender East here, um, a really great kind of a uh, fancy term for this. I I'm just into recently, meeting with some old niggas. <laughs> um, an artist talk was, um, was called, uh, uh, with was that the term uh, grounded consciousness. I just So I use the tenets of, uh, so in my analysis of the album, in my writing, I use these kind of tenets of Asian Canadian cultural act activism. So we have identity, history, community, and representation, which I'll be talking about now. So identity um, is a very integral part of the Asian Canadian experience. And of course, of many other experience of immigrant groups and uh, diasporic individuals in general. Uh, what I'm showing you on the screen here is uh, kind of how I came to looking at identity through my uh, work. So um, this is a book called The Chinese in Vancouver by Wang Chung Ng, uh, written in the 90s, I believe, or early 2000s. Um, so he gave a really kind of um, useful breakdown of looking at the different, you know, um, you know kind of identity formation within the Chinese, uh, Vancouver Chinese Canadian community. So his three groups were the old timers who were basically, you know, some of the very, you know, early immigrants who had come uh, from China to Canada, many of the ones who came, um, you know, before, basically before Chinese immigration was totally excluded um, to Canada from 1923 to 1947. Um, there was the uh, Tu Sheng um, in Mandarin or Tu Sang in Cantonese. Uh, my pronunciation's not good. <laughs> Uh, which basically literally means native born. So this was the identity group of Chinese Canadians who were born in Canada, which uh, includes me basically. Um, um, and so, and then there was also the post-war immigrants. As I just mentioned, uh, Chinese immigration to Canada was totally barred basically from 1923 to 1947. So, uh, after 1947, when it opened up again, you got the, this, uh, you know, another, you know, wave of Chinese immigrants, you know, coming from China, coming from Hong Kong, Taiwan, et cetera, uh, or many other parts of the world. Um, they're you know, not near China as well. And so, as you can probably imagine, you know, coming from so many different times, coming from so many different times in China's history, uh, you know, the old timers still coming from you know, late in the Qing dynasty or in the early days of the Republic of China, um, the Canadian born, of course, with uh, many of them, some had a connection to China, so some had absolutely no connection to China. 
um, the post-war immigrants, you know, coming from a China that was in the throes of the civil war between um, uh, Mao's communists and the nationalists uh, led by Chiang Kai-shek. Um, and, you know, coming and, you know, coming even more after Mao uh, won in the civil war and took over China. So, you know, three different groups coming from three different, you know, life experiences. And again, it's, it's important to note that, you know, of course, uh, you know, Asian Canadian itself includes so many you know, categories, you know, Chinese Canadian, Vietnamese Canadian, Filipino Canadian, just like the Chinese Canadian community itself, so many different people in it. It's not a homogenous group. Uh, um, and so there are a lot of ways that uh, this is shown in the album. So for example, this photograph here, um, quite directly, you see a young woman standing in front of a Chinatown storefront. You can tell from the Chinese characters, you can see the, the address on the door in the back here. Um, but of course she is wearing, um, you know, a Western style fashion outfit, the bell bottom pants, of course, the cap that were, you know, very indicative of a very certain time period, certain locale, right, North America in the 1970s, which was, of course, when this photograph was taken. Uh, interestingly, uh, Jim Wong Chu is actually reflected in the photograph way in the back in the door here, the shadowy figure there. Um, and I was just talking about uh, Mao and the Civil War in China. This is another uh, really fantastic photograph from the album. Um, which also speaks to identity a lot. And there's a really fantastic story uh, behind it that I found uh, through my research. Um, through this video, I found of Jim Wong Chu giving a poetry reading. And so um, I'd first like to let him tell everybody the story behind this photograph. What happened is that the image here is a, a picture of Ho Mao. And the photograph is when Mao passed away. And what happened was that uh, this mouse group decided to uh, uh, honor him. So uh, the next day, uh, there was just the entire Chinatown was just plastered over 60, 70 po uh, of these posters are plastered all over Chinatown. And then the, the day after, I went down to Chinatown, and almost every one of them were defaced and scratched. And I scratched out, um, you know, and it kind of shocked me. I just just kind of felt this kind of hate, but it was almost like a self-hate. And so I went and photographed all these photographs. And then when it came time to develop, to put an image on this book, is that uh, I called this book Chinatown Ghost. I felt that the image was apt for it. So I, that's what I did, right? And then because um, the, uh, there's a picture of Mao, the right wing uh, Taiwanese uh, decided that they were going to boycott it. And the, uh, the left wing, because Mao's pictures on there was a side scratch show, they didn't want to see it either. So this book was banned in China. So, like Jim just said, of course, you might have noticed earlier when I showed the uh, pictures of his poetry book, Chinatown Ghost, that uh, this is the picture that was on the, he chose for the cover, as he talked about there. So, um, so for people who don't know what he was talking about, um, uh, was the, again, what I just mentioned, the Chinese civil war between uh, Mao's communists, the party and the nationalists um, at that time led by Chiang Kai-shek, the party was called Kuomintang. And so basically uh, at the end of the Chinese civil war, Mao's uh, communist party won, of course, um, and, uh, and he set up the People's Republic of China, which we, uh, which is still around today. Um, and Chiang Kai-shek's uh, Kuomintang Nationalist Party um, had to basically go into exile in Taiwan. So, for people who might not, people here who might not know, that's uh, you know that's basically origins of a lot of the um, tensions between you know Taiwan and China that continue to this day. Um, and so, of course, you know uh, the. Chinese diaspora communities, you know, all around the world, you know, they, again, you know, not a homogenous group. They, you know, some people uh, were in support of Mao. Some people were in support of the nationalists in Taiwan. So, of course, within these communities, these communities outside of China, this caused 
this kind of conflict that we see here. Uh, Canada itself uh, basically, uh, you know, cut off ties with China when it became the People's Republic of China in 1949, um, and didn't uh, reestablish relationships with the PRC all the way until 1976, which uh, which was when Mao died and Mao's successors um, started um, reforming the government there. So history is another very important um, aspect here. Uh, of course, in the kind of attempts to resurface overlooked histories and narrative and historical narratives, which is um, of course something very pertinent to today still, um, and especially for Chinese Canadians, it was um, you know regaining, um, reclaiming Chinese people's place in Canadian history, as I'm. Uh, sure, as we all know, you know, Chinese people, uh, Chinese individuals uh, played a very large role in uh, Canada's history. So as an example, I have this picture here. Um, it's a portrait of a man named Wing Wong. As you can see in the text on the side, um, I'm gonna blow up the picture here. You can see he was a World War II veteran. You can see all his medals, his uh, portrait of himself as a young soldier. So the kind of little life story that Jim Wong Chu put on the side here says, you know, relays a lot of these you know, moments in you know, Chinese Canadian history. And of course they affected very real people. Uh, here he says, Wing Wong paid the $500 um, you know, head tax to come to Canada. And of course he served in the Canadian army. He was, um, I believe it says he was at the liberation of Hong Kong uh, since Hong Kong was, had been uh, taken by the Japanese during World War II. Um, another really important thing that you know this photo kind of references as well is the fact that, I mean, Chinese Canadian veterans were some of the one of the most vocal groups to uh, fight for the enfranchisement, the giving of the vote to Chinese Canadians you know, after World War II, um, because of course um, you know many Chinese Canadians fought in World War II, World War I even, you know, they'd given their life to this uh, new country that they came to, but this country didn't see them at that time, you know, before that time as, um, you know, as citizens even. And these two photographs here are very interesting. Um, they're both uh, successive um, in the album. They come one after e each other. The left one comes first and then uh, the right one. They also are both basically the end pictures to the whole album. It's a very powerful ending, I have to say. Um, and it really, you know, shows you this this huge this history of Chinese labor use in Canada. So on the left, we have a picture of, um, of a fish canning machine. Um, and Chinese Canadians and then many other immigrant groups are um, very well known for working in the canneries. Of course. You know, supremely contributed to the economy of you know BC and West Coast. Um, on the right, we have a photograph of um, a, you know, a newer generation of Chinese Canadians outside this uh, boxcar, this railway boxcar here. Of course, referencing the you know large use of Chinese labor in the building of the Canadian Pacific Railway. Um, and as we know, the Canadian Pacific Railway was really really helped make Canada in a sense is it was the whole reason why you know British Columbia uh, joined Confederation that was one of their um that was one of the guarantees you know John A. Macdonald had to make that they were going to build a CPR to connect BC to eastern Canada to you know create the country we're in now and of course a lot of that was um how you know used Chinese labor um at the same time these two photographs are really interesting because they it kind of moved from, go, there's a movement from going from, you know, more stereotypes, you know, the cannery machine, of course, you can see it's called the iron chink, a very derogatory term, uh, because the machines were made to, um, uh, made to, uh, you know, replace Chinese labor. Um, and so, and on the other side, um, 
Uh, we have this new contemporary generation of Chinese Canadians, um, you know, standing proudly in front of this boxcar, you know, reclaiming their history. And so next part would be community, the idea of community, the community, of course, is integral to the Chinese Canadian experience and to Vancouver's, um, you know, and especially to Vancouver's Chinatown. Um, you know, one part is just the fact that the creation of Chinatowns was this kind of the creation of a community. Of course, Chinatowns were created because um, usually, you know, a, a white Western European society, uh, you know, didn't want Chinese individuals living amongst them. And so they pushed them to the fringes of the city. Um, in, Van in Vancouver, um, Vancouver's Chinatown was built on what's now called False Creek. False Creek before was a it's now been built, o built over heavily, but um, um, it used to be this, you know, large marshy land. So you know, it was really at the fringes of the city, and you know, uh, they basically, you know, forced Chinese individuals to live in that area. Um, the creation of what are called clan and benevolent societies uh, were created in many Chinatowns, and these were created to help new Chinese immigrants, you know, find their bearings and their place uh, in Canada. These societies were basically created out of, um, there was a familial con connection. Um, these societies uh, were basically banded around individuals who came from the same family name or same villages from, uh, from, Canada, from uh, China. Um, and so, you know, when, someone new would come over and they were from the same village or the same family, they would you know, help each other out. Um, as well in Vancouver Chinatown's uh, post-war history, uh, many, many examples of um, community action, um, and especially political action. So there were protests against two different freeways that were going to be built through Chinatown, which would have leveled you know, large parts of the neighborhood. Uh, protests against policies that would have um, endangered uh, barbecue, uh, the selling of Chinese barbecue meats, very traditional food, um, and a lot of uh, rezoning and redevelopment practices, especially in the neighborhood called Strathcona, which is basically the residential neighborhood next to uh, Vancouver's Chinatown. Um, a lot of rezoning and redevelopment done by, uh, planned by the city without much input by the, uh, from the residents that live there. Um, so a good example, an example of an organization that came up because of this was the uh, Strathcona Property Owners and Tenants Association, or shortened to SPODA. So you can really see the sense of you know, community in the way the photographs are taken. Um, these two, for example, here, you know, the subjects, uh, subjects in his photographs, they look um, very comfortable. They're looking at the camera. They appear in the context of Chinatown. It's not just portraits of the people themselves. There's the um, you know, context of where they are, as you can see. Um, and I learned through my research that, excuse me, uh, Jim Wong Chu, he talked to his subjects a lot before taking, um, before taking uh, pictures of them. He wanted to really get kind of their, their story from them before taking their picture. Um, and he, would, he also spoke about giving back, um, uh, basically giving prints to a lot of his subjects after taking their picture. So printing their picture out and giving it back to them. And um, uh, many, you know, many of these people were people he knew personally as well within Chinatown. Um, related to the community political action I was just talking about, many pictures of um, political campaigning uh, appear in the album, as I mentioned earlier, and they really show this kind of new power, new uh, political influence that the Chinese community, uh, Canadian community had, especially in the post-war era. Um, and you can see on these two pictures here on the left is this uh, political campaign happening in Chinatown. On the right, you see um, this storefront for a bakery called Wo Fat Ko, which was, which I learned was a very popular bakery in Chinatown back in the day. And it's you know, uh, all 
piled up with these uh, political posters here. And with the photograph on the right, and zoom that in, uh, I learned that uh, you can see these two individuals here. I was uh, told this individual here is likely a man named Quan H. Wong, who was a very well-known um, insurance broker in Chinatown at the time. Uh, the sign for his business is a, still visible in Chinatown to this day. This man here is a man named um, Lo Po Yin, who actually appears uh, in a portrait later in the album. So again, the, you know, again, this Chinese Canadian political influence in the post-war period, especially after a time when they were stripped of so many uh, rights. And lastly, I'll talk a bit about, you know, the idea of representation, again, very pertinent to this age. So at the time period that you know, Jim Wangchi was taking these pictures, there are many new cultural works, uh, publications, organizations that were cropping up to um, basically work to change the representation of Asian Canadians at the time. Um, so this came in the form again of a lot of different uh, publications um, and organizations, like I said, uh, local ones uh, being Asian Canadian Writers Workshop, Pender Guy, uh, like I mentioned earlier, and again, Jim Wong Chu, he was part of, part of both of them. Um, and to give a sense of the kind of uh, how people felt at the time about the representation of Asian uh, Canadians, um, I wanna read a quote from um, a local publication from the time period that was published by the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop. <clears throat> It's called Inalienable Rice from 1979. Um, I'll read a little bit from the introduction. So they wrote that Asian models remain non-existent. Today, we still have Asians starring in commercials, selling real ramen or winning at table tennis, but losing the girl to the guy with white hairspray. So another uh, prominent publication was the Asian Canadian here, which I'm showing you, um, um, an Asian, a kind of pan Asian Canadian magazine published from 1978 to 1985 and was uh, founded in Toronto, in fact. Um, and, you know, like these other publications that were cropping up, it published writing and art about Asian Canadians and by Asian Canadians. And it, you know, it, had many, many themes throughout its publication history, not just um, uh, about, you know, just East Asians, but, you know, Southeast Asians, South Asians as well, about women in Asian Canadian uh, societies, about queer Asian Canadians. So again, you know, this group is not, uh, this community is not homogenous. There's many, many issues and things at play here. And of course, as you can see here, this was an issue. Um, this was an issue about Vancouver specifically, I believe. And um, Jim Wong Chu himself was published in it, of course. And this is the this is the uh, photographs and his poetry that he uh, submitted to this edition of it. And with this uh, spread here, with text and this photograph, um, also kind of speaks to representation. Uh, again, this kind of lack of models, um, especially with, you know, Chinese Canadian individuals and, for example, in this case, high profile professions. We see this uh, man here standing in front of his uh, London drug optical storefront. Um, as I've said already, there was, um, of course, a lack of uh, a lot of social power within uh, for Chinese Canadian individuals, you know, before World War II. Again, they weren't allowed to vote. They couldn't become citizens. Many professions were barred from them, especially things like being practicing doctors. Um, and the little text that Jim Wong Chu wrote here, which I'll also zoom in, uh, also, also really speaks to this theme of representation. So he writes here, Pender Street East, Chinatown, people, Chinese Canadians with hopes and dreams no different than you and me. The following photographs and writings hopefully reveal a glimpse of the thoughts and feelings of the community I call home. So for the next uh, kind of second half of my talk, I would like to move on to a discussion about my research process, basically, and how it, you know, 
uh, helped inform my knowledge of the album. And of course, uh, again, my goal of connecting the album to Vancouver's Chinatown and the community. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is the um, is Jim Wong Chu's fawns again. Um, and the fact that uh, within his fawns, you know, um, they contain a lot of his contact sheets and his negatives. So as we uh, as we got a feel of early on that uh, a lot of people here, there are a few people here that uh, know a lot about photographic history um, and photographic techniques throughout the years, some people uh, who might not. So just to give a, a little explainer about the importance of contact sheets, especially in doing this kind of research is that, um, you know, contact sheet was created uh, when a photographer took their whole roll of film as, uh, you know, you can use this as an example, they placed it over photographic paper, exposed it to light, and they would get a print with all of their pictures on it um, together. So it's kind of a pre-digital way of, you know, seeing all your photographs at once. And this is really important when uh, doing research on photographs, uh, because photographs that appear on the same rolls, you know, you can kind of assume they were, for example, taken at the same time. If they were taken at the same time, maybe they relate to a similar event. So, um, so I'll reveal how that was important very soon. So this one I have in the, as an example here is the negative I found of the pictures I just uh, I just showed earlier the man in front of London Drug Optical here. So um, partly why it was really also interesting going through his uh, negatives and contact sheets was that, uh, again, he took like, he took a lot of pictures. So there was a lot of material there and a lot of them were um, related to um, you know, and so a lot of them weren't published in his album. A lot of them were related to contemporary events that happened in Vancouver's Chinatown at the time. Um, and so I have two examples here. So on the left um, is a picture from uh, this time period where there was a conflict between two Chinatown organizations, uh, the Chinese Community Center Society and the uh, Chinese Benevolent Association. Uh, basically, the community center, CCC, um, were uh, kind of blaming the uh, Benevolent Association, the CBA, of kind of corruption among their ranks of their governance. So, and again, this was really another example of this kind of battle of identity of different, you know, individuals within the Chinese Canadian community. The CCC was started in 1973 and so kind of represented a kind of newer generation of Chinese Canadians, while the CBA um, uh, was one of those, you know, old early benevolent associations and it was started in the you know, early 20th century. So again, you get that, um, yeah, battle of identity there and Jim Wong Chu photographed it. On the right here is, um, is part of uh, pictures from a protest against one of those freeways I mentioned earlier. Um, so it was basically a freeway that was going to be built through what's called Quebec Street in Vancouver's Chinatown. It would have gone through the future site of the, the Chinese Community Center, uh, which was eventually built in 1980. Uh, so at this time, there was just, uh, just a campaign to get it built. So the sign here says, disconnect the connector. So Jim Wong Chu was also around for that. Um, there's a whole contact sheet of pictures he took from that, that time. And so this example here, um, um, fortunately I was able to find many contact sheets that had photographs from the album. And this let me do um, a lot of fun things kind of in my head. So I'm gonna zoom in on this little four square section here. So these two pictures over here, um, this picture up here is a group of Chinese butchers standing outside their storefront. This uh, picture here is um, a child in a um, uh, Chinese festival parade. So both of these pictures appear in the album, but they both appear at very, very far apart from each other. They, the one on the top here appears quite early um, in the album than the other one quite later. So, you know, you, you might think like, oh, they're, they're, some, they're different, right? They're, 
they don't appear next to each other um, in the album. They might be about different things, different events, but through this contact sheet here, I was able to find out that they were really, you know, both from the same event, as they're both on the same, um, they're both from the same role of film. So it was basically the event was some, you know, Chinese parade, Chinese relate, uh, Chinese um, festival, um, in which this child was participating in. The reason why these barbecue meat butchers were outside their store like this is because they were watching this parade unfold. So again, it gave more context to the photo to the photographs in the album that I was looking at. And this one was one I found that had a majority, a lot of it were photographs from the album, all these ones here. And you can see, you know, Jim Wong Chu, he, he um, you know, circled, squared a lot of the pictures, which is a way photographers back in the day, uh, you know, they would remind how the way they would, you know, remind themselves that I want to choose this picture to print. So, um, and of course, uh, we know he did print them because they appeared in the album. Um, so I'd like to briefly just talk about this top one here. Um, so this picture here comes from the political campaigning section I mentioned much earlier. Um, it's this man here standing in front of this, uh, you know, political candidates, Alan Lau's uh, political headquarter in Chinatown. And so I was actually able to find which specific election these photographs came from, and that was the um, Vancouver Civic Election of 1975. So, um, so that helped me date this photograph um, to um, to um, to 1975, of course. And so that meant, of course, with what I just talked about, since these other photographs were on the same contact sheet. Um, that, uh, that these other photographs were also taken in 1975. So again, it was very helpful for providing more context to um, what was going on here. I will. Are you able to share, uh, Brandon, or? Oh, uh, sorry? Are you sh sharing your screen or? Has has that changed? Oh, I'm still sharing it. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. You All can right. see it, right? No, I can't. Oh, really? <clears throat> Let me try that again. <clears throat> Sorry. Did did that just happen or what happened? No, I just I just can't see it. I'm just oh, making okay. sure that everybody else can see yeah, it. Yeah, sure. Just making sure that I okay. I think it's there it is. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, um, so, sorry, where was that? Yeah, okay, I was here. So, um, next part I'd like to talk about is uh, the interviews I did. So I did some, of course, again, as a way to connect the album to the Chinese Canadian community, I did some interviews with uh, people within the community, um, some uh, mainly people who knew Jim, um, especially who knew him during the time he was creating these photographs. Um, it was a pretty basic process. I basically um, would virtually thrip, flip through the album uh, with people uh, over Zoom, of course, because of COVID. And um, luckily I had taken a picture of each page of the album before COVID hit. And I was very lucky actually, because um, when COVID hit, I, I didn't really have access to the album anymore. Um, and so I and I asked people, you know, I flipped it through them and asked if they, you know, would say something if they, you know, recognized any of the places or the people or the events happening in the photographs. So I got a really a lot of really fantastic stories out of this. Um, so for this picture, um, I was told that this woman here was actually a very well known uh, newspaper vendor in Chinatown. She was kind of a, a fixture there. Um, and you can see that is indeed what she is selling here, uh, newspapers. Uh, there's still a great tradition of uh, older Chinese individuals selling things uh, on the street side. You still go down to many Chinatowns, not just Vancouver's people selling 
fruit and vegetables on the street. Uh, many times they are elderly women. So something that still uh, happens to this day. Um, there are a large amount of photos taken in a certain part of Chinatown that I uh, began to notice. So um, this picture is one of them. I could recognize, I could start to kind of recognize a lot, or like remember um, a lot of these, you know, street signs or uh, business signs, for example, cropping up in other pictures. Um, and then um, cropping up in other, in other pictures. So I could tell, you know, a lot of these pictures were taken in this kind of same areas, which is interesting as well. And so I kind of got a reason for this because I was told um, this section of Chinatown along uh, Pender Street, of course, is the namesake of the album, uh, and within the specific 200 block of Pender East was one of the busiest and most happening places in Chinatown at the time. Uh, I was told that's where kind of all the popular shops and restaurants are and everyone would go there to do their shopping and eating and everything. This photograph here was a bit of a, a mystery to me because I can't uh, read Chinese, unfortunately. Um, but I was told um, that these posters were actually advertising uh, Hong Kong singers. And um, another really interesting thing is that one of my interviewees, he told me that he could actually recognize from the, the slope of the street what, what this building was specifically and where it was in Chinatown and that it was uh, a building that housed a very well-known restaurant uh, that was called uh, Ming's. It was very popular back in the day. It was both, it was like a restaurant, uh, restaurant, entertainment, nightclub venue. Uh, I was told recently it was a, a underground venue as well. Um, it was kind of below street level, apparently. One of the greatest discoveries I, one of the really great discoveries I had was that one of my interviewee subjects um, actually helped Jim Wong Shu with the creation of the poetry section here. So a lot, pretty much all the poems are written by Jim, um, but the handwriting here I found out um, was not actually by him, but it was by one of a friend of his, friends of his, friend of his, who I was fortunate enough to interview, um, and basically you know, he asked her to help him out. Uh, he liked her handwriting. I guess he didn't uh, think his handwriting was good enough. So she helped him, you know, do the handwriting for his poetry and looking through his negatives and materials again, I found um, these negatives, which uh, kind of show you how he printed the poems onto photographic paper. So he would have had his friend, you know, write out the poems, then Jim must have um, re-photographed them on these large pieces of film, of copy film, and then would have enlarged them onto the photographic paper. So interesting to learn, you know, how all this came about. Um, and uh, one of the second last thing I'd like to talk about uh, through the interviews um, and because I'd been just looking and staring at these photographs for so long, <laughs> for many months, I began to just be able to recognize, again, recognize places and I could like start to actually pinpoint where they had been taken. Uh, within Vancouver's Chinatown. So for example, I'm just showing here, uh, this is one of Jim's pictures. This is a picture I took uh, last year, last summer in the same spot um, um, where he would have taken his own picture. You can see this, this roof line here still exists. Uh, I believe it, it housed a kind of good, kind of good store called Yun Fong. So, so doing this wasn't really uh, too, um, too um, it wasn't particularly important to my analysis of the album. Like, you know, if I didn't do this, uh, I guess I could have just handed in my paper fine, but I thought it was a really great kind of extra side project to do and add into my thesis at the end. So basically uh, what I produced was um, this Google Maps, My Maps of where his photographs were taken throughout Chinatown. Um, if, for people that don't know, uh, Google Maps has a service called My Maps, which basically lets you use Google Maps and lets you put down, uh, lets you put down your own kind of pins for certain locales. And then you can add like descriptions about those uh, locales. So 
I'll just uh, get out of screen sharing here quickly. I'm just going to show you how this looks. So it looks like this. It looks like Google Maps, um, but you see all these little photo markers. So you can click on them. Um, and so you know, I basically linked um, you know the pictures that I could identify the location for. Um, and then description I had given the photograph um, from my research. Um, and so, yeah, I just uh, mapped them all out here. And um, oh, honestly, it was one of the things I was kind of most proud of doing. It was just really great to see this come together and again, connect the photos to a real place. So of course I like to share this with everyone. I'm gonna put it in the, put it in the chat quickly if I can. I'll go back to my presentation. So I'd like to finally end my presentation um, with one more topic. So one of the greatest gifts of research, in my opinion, is finding something unexpected or just totally new about uh, you know, your subject or topic of research that either confirms or uh, changes what you had originally hypothesized, basically. Um, and so I would like to end my presentation with one such of uh, these discoveries um, of the former, which confirmed one kind of uh, one part of my hypothesis. And I like to call this the case of the grass dragon. So at the end of the Chinese festivities section in the, um, in the album is a poem uh, basically relating uh, this grass dragon performance that happened um, during the Mid-Autumn Festival of 1975 um, that was held by the Chinese Cultural Center Society. Um, so basically the grass dragon is a Southern Chinese uh, kind of tradition performance of creating a dragon out of dried grass after a period of harvest um, incense would be, sticks would be stuck into it and it would be kind of paraded around as you can see um, in the photograph here. Um, and so the, um, the idea to do this at the time here was actually an idea from Jim himself. He had seen it uh, happen in Southern China and he wanted to uh, bring it back to Vancouver. And one of the really kind of interesting things I had learned about was that this performance was uh, when Jim helped put it on in the 70s. It was the first and only time it happened in Chinatown until last year. Actually, this picture here is one I took of the second Grass Dragon Festival in Vancouver's Chinatown. Just happened last year before I was, I'd heard, you know, it never happened again and it did. And that was really fantastic. Um, and so, this poem and this photograph I found out was actually published uh, elsewhere. It was published in that um, Inalienable Rice publication that I mentioned earlier. Um, again, Jim Wong Chu also contributed to that. Um, so both the poem and that photograph I just showed everybody were included in that volume. And so it really revealed something very interesting that the poem um, itself was actually written by Paul Yi, who's another very well-known um, you know, Chinese-Canadian activist, artist, writer, who is currently Toronto-based, in fact, and that the, the photograph was actually credited, to, credited in the book to an individual named uh, Xu Tung Wong. Um, so, um, you know, I found out that those two works were actually by different people. Um, not that Jim, you know, tried to pull it off as his own work, of course. Uh, there's this acknowledgments page at the back of the album, which lists a few people who he thanked in making this album. So you see both Paul's name and Shu Tung Wong's name there. Um, so this really, this really um, showed me that the album was really a collaborative process, you know, and the name Jim Wong choose on it. Um, most of the photos are his, but and like I just explained with uh, how he got his friend to help with the handwriting of the poetry, um, you know, the album, uh, that the album was really kind of a, almost in a way a work of the community. And that was really just fantastic to find out because again, it, it really validated the, 
the fact that I was using this uh, analysis of you know community to um, talk about um, to analyze the album in there. So that was a really that was one of the that was one of the top discoveries I have to say in my research process there. So um, thank you very much, everybody. I finally done talking. Um, I'm just going to leave up a little personal plugs, just uh, my email, some places you can find me. Uh, every, anyone's welcome to contact me if they like, if they want to uh, uh, have more questions, or um, I can share the slides, of course, with people um, and everything. So <clears throat> yeah, thank you so much. Great. Excellent. Excellent. All right. So, uh, so again, uh, question, Brandon. Yes. Uh, if you got a little bit more background on the photographer Jason, um, like, was he Jim, known for Jim. other Jim. projects or anything of that nature? Um. So for for Jim, right? For Jim Wong Chu, what other projects he did? Um. Yeah, he. I mean, yeah, apart, I mean, there's a lot I listed out already. There was the, the poetry collection. He, he published Chinatown Ghosts, which was um, his, the first edition wasn't just, was, wasn't his photographs. It was, he never really formally published his photographs in that sense. It was just his poetry at that time because that's what he was, he was interested in doing. So there was that, there was um, the, uh, yeah, the other programs, Pender Guy, that was a radio program run by Chinese Canadians um, in Vancouver's Chinatown back uh, during that time period. So they would host, you know, shows, stories, interviews relating to, you know, Chinese Canadian issues, stories. Um, the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop that I, um, that I mentioned, um, again, still running today is this uh, kind of group that um, uh, put together that would you know invite writers of Asian Canadian descent to you know work on their work on their writing and they would help them publish it too to kind of you know bring out you know further again the representation of you know Asian Canadian artists cultural producers out there um, and so I mean and I think in just general he was constantly like researching Chinese Canadian history he just knew so much. So he really, really had his hand in like, uh, in a little bit of everything within the community. So yeah, so you know, he's not just not just a photographer; he's a community leader, he's an activist, etc. Yeah, uh, he was obviously very varied in what he was involved in, but I, I actually was more zeroing in specifically on his photographic work. Like, oh, okay, a, a commercial photographer was he? Like, he he did this obviously as a passion, and he had a lot of other passions related to the community and to other art forms. But I was just kind of wondering photographically what his uh, his focus was. Uh, yeah, true. for sure. Um, yeah, so again, the photography part was, yeah, he never, you know, worked professionally as a photographer. The photography part was, uh, and very interesting fact, he only ever, he really, he worked professionally as a, as a mail carrier throughout most of his life, actually, while he was doing all this other work. Um, and so, um, yeah, he, he wasn't really in the professional side of it. A lot of what he did was, of course, towards this, you know, activism and artistry within the community. And so he he did, he just had this kind of very focused and, um, yeah, but still very uh, fertile photographic practice in this early period throughout the 1970s, basically, um, where he was creating a lot of this, of the work I was just showing. And besides that, um, basically after like the 80s, he kind of, stopped really doing you know photography like this a lot because he really was focused on the writing at that point um so you know nowadays he's really he's really known for his his writing work and his uh, his poetry but yeah this is kind of like an early period for him that maybe sometimes you know talked about talked about less um it's again another reason why i wanted to talk about it, and just because the photographs are really amazing 
Okay, thank you. Because, yeah, I mean, the style that he chose didn't appear to be, I'll call it amateurish. You yeah. Know, I said it very much emulates the, the look of street photography of the yeah, period. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, it kind of makes you think that he had other work beyond this that perhaps he had been working on or, or had published. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like I said, he was he was taking photography classes at the, um, yeah, what was called the Vancouver School of Art here in Vancouver. And he he actually, you can, uh, some, some places you hear him talk about, you know, being influenced by like Walker Evans, Diane Arbus, you know, you can see the, the influence really in there. So he, he would have definitely been, um, been, uh, Definitely, I'm sure he was, you know, no, he, he was, um, yeah, aware of, you know, other, you know, other art photographers out there and he was going to school for photography. So he was being uh, shown these things. So yeah, definitely. Uh, but again, it was, you know, like an ends to a means. It wasn't, uh, you know, he, he moved on to other things that he thought were um, more, I guess, more uh, other, other things. He was more, he was more interested at the time, I think. At the time, he had said, "I think, I think there's a video I watched watched of him where he said that he um, he had kind of switched to writing as well with the um, with the uh, sorry with yeah he there was a video where he talked about the kind of the Wayne and black and white documentary photography near the end of the 70s that was another reason why he kind of went away from it. So that was a kind of interesting tidbit I found out too, but." Yeah, he was definitely, definitely interested. He was definitely, you know, I'm sure he was aware. He was influenced a little bit. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to read a couple of questions yeah, from, sure. from the chat. Uh, from Michael Hankus. Hey, Brandon. Well done. Your subject, Jim Wonshu, uh, pursued uh, photography to reconnect and familiarize himself with his culture and background. Did you find this project help you to do the same? And it's followed by uh, another comment here, question. Uh, in terms of your photography ventures, what influence or impact do you think this thesis will have on your future photography? Yeah, so, I mean, my background right now is one of my photographs. <laughs> it's from a um, Chinese New Year's parade in the Chinatown here. So. Definitely, I mean, with all this interest um, in you know, Chinese Canadian history I've had recently, um, it's definitely influenced that a lot. I've definitely started, you know, just like Jim himself, you know, uh, exploring that through my own work. Um, just last year, I was in Victoria on the island um, and I visited, uh, they have a very old Chinese cemetery there, which I visited because um, I'd learned about it from one of uh, Jim's poems. Um, so I, I wanted to go there, see it as a this historical site. Um, and, um, yeah, these cemeteries are very important in Chinese Canadian history because, um, a lot of the times Chinese individuals, the Im immigrants, it, when, if they died in Canada, they were first buried, um, in Canada. And then many years later, their remains would be um, dug up and interned and sent back to China for a proper burial in their in their home town, home village. So, oh, wow. you know, so learning about these yeah, parts of Chinese Canadian history and like, um, yeah, connecting with my kind of subjects, I guess I'm interested in photographing. So certainly has had a uh, influence, yeah. Excellent. We have another question uh, from Megan Chang and Daniel uh, Iwama. We followed and support a lot of contemporary Chinese Canadian activism in Chinatown today, mm -hmm. specifically around gentrification and new development. Having come to know mm -hmm. Wang Xu uh, through your research, do you have a take on where his energies might be directed today where he's still with us? That's a really great question. Thanks, Megan and Daniel. Um, I think uh, I'd say, you know, yeah, it's, uh, you know, gentrification is a huge topic in uh, Vancouver's Chinatown, Toronto's Chinatown too, of course. And um, I think really the energies 
uh, really still there. And of course, he he passed away uh, still relatively recently, 2017. So and he he was still working on stuff till then. So the energy was always there. And I I think the energy, not just from him, but of the time period of the 70s and Asian Canadian cultural activism, uh, really still still remains. I mean, especially especially recently, you know, with campaigns against anti-Asian hate and on for and so forth. Um, and within China, Vancouver's Chinatown, you know, people, uh, it's getting increasingly gentrified and uh, unfortunately, and um, you know, a lot of people, uh, there's a lot of rhetoric about people saying it's, um, you know, a shadow of its former self. And, and maybe you can say that in the physical sense, but a lot of the spirit, uh, I really think is still there. There are a lot of still contemporary organizations that are still doing a lot of good work in Chinatown um, I mentioned Jim had been volunteering with seniors in the 60s and he, and there are still organizations that are doing that. Um, um, the Yarrow Intergenerational uh, Society. Um, there are a lot of, so, a lot of organizations um, still doing a lot of the, this kind of cultural work and educational work. So just recently, a Chinese Canadian Museum Society just um, just kind of formed in Vancouver and they uh, opened up a temporary exhibition in Chinatown, which I volunteer that, um, uh, volunteer that there um, over last summer. So, and you know, it's still, a lot of these histories are still yet to be told and still not in the you know popular culture, popular consciousness. So so yeah, basically, I, I still think the energy is still there. And even if he's gone, I mean, there's so many other people, again, that he worked with um, that, you know, continue, uh, continue the, the legacy and the spirit. Great. We have more questions. We have an anonymous question. Okay. Um, following Jim's path in Chinatown, where is your favorite location in Vancouver's Chinatown? Oh, very good question. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and well, as you, as a, a course, um, with the map I showed everybody, I, um, I, um, yeah, you know, I could really just walk through on Pender Street and I can just recognize where he took the picture is really fascinating. Oh, favorite, uh, favorites hard, any favorites hard. There's, um, there's a photograph that's not in the album, but I've seen of his around that shows this come, um, shows this uh, very slim building that was made built in what used to be an alleyway um, next to what was the Yip Sang building, which was a building um, that was built by a, a merchant, a Chinese merchant back in the day and now houses an art gallery. Uh, right next to it is this, is this very slim building it was used as a kind of art center back in the day. So that the facade of the building is still there and it's just like super slim. Um, but behind the facade, it's just the alleyway again, there's nothing there. But I think it's just really interesting that facade is still there. Um, there's a sign uh, that I could see in some of his pictures that's actually I figured out was still in Chinatown today. It's extremely faded, but the sign itself is still there. It's not actually being used for any purpose or by any business it's still in the, the building that the sign is on, but the sign itself is still there. And you can see it still has the writing that was on the sign, very faded, uh, very faded writing. Um, it was for like a records and goods store. But uh, you can see it, you know, fully fleshed out back in the day from Jim's pictures, but the, the sign still exists there um, somehow. <laughs> um, yeah, so little, little things like that, you know, I just started to notice, like just all along Pender East, it's just kind of really, yeah, really, again, reminds you this stuff happened, still happens. Um, um, and then, yeah, just connects you back to the community and the location so much. So that's a, that's a good question. No, Celio, I don't think I can hear you right now. We have one more question um, okay. from El Centro uh, Aciclic uh, from El Salvador. Okay. 
Um, in El Salvador before 1900, Chinese women worked taking care of babies. Not really a nanny, but, but close. Right now, chinear uh, means to coo or to rock a baby. Can you tell any words or traditions that people considered Canadian, but are really from Chinese culture? Oh, that's a very good question. Hmm. I feel like some people in the audience probably will have more answers than I can, <laughs> than, than, uh, than I will right now. Um, yeah. Yeah, right, if so anybody has examples of that in the chat, I'm, I'm sure there are. Um, I don't know, something that just reminded me though, though is, uh, and talking about this relationship between indigenous communities and um, Chinese Canadian communities in in BC, in BC, um, in BC there's this um, this kind of uh, language that was made um, called um, called uh, called Chinook, and it's what's considered a pidgin language. It's kind of a language made up from many. Uh, many different um, different languages. So it takes from some indigenous language. It takes from English. It takes from, I believe it takes from Chinese. And so, so it was used as a kind of trade language between all the different people that were living in you know, BC in the very early, um, you know, between settlers and indigenous people to conduct business and trade. So, yeah, I've heard. I've heard a few phrases like this. I think there's one called "hi muckamuck." I forget what it means, but I, that's kind of I think something that came out of that that moment. Oh. So uh, that's kind of what it reminded me of. I don't have any better examples off the top of my head. I'm sure other people here probably do, but I have to remind myself what "hi muckamuck" meant. But that's okay. that's something I can think about right now. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Excellent. Uh, we have another question uh, this time from, uh, well, before a thank you from Megan Shank. Thank you, Brandon. Fantastic presentation. And then a question from Hillary uh, Chan. It's sad to think that with the ongoing gentrification of Chinatown, it will become harder and harder to recognize where his photographs were taken. Although it would always be nice to recognize these existing locations, What's your opinion on Chinatown turning into a tourist type uh, history museum? If we were to try to preserve Chinatown as it is or find a way to perpetuate its use as a working functioning Chinatown, amazing, uh, amazing, uh, amazing thesis, Brandon. Okay. okay. Um, great, yeah, Hillary is a was a classmate of mine at Ryerson. So thanks for coming, Hillary. That's a really good question. She also did a her thesis on um, um, on a woman who uh, first lived in Vancouver's Chinatown um, and then moved to Toronto. So she's also a scholar in this area. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I think part of that is like any Chinatown, especially Vancouver's, it was always kind of always eventually became a tourist area. Um, I mean, of course, that's not the reason it was created. But, um, you know, for Vancouver's Chinatown in um, 1936, there was like a um, big citywide festival for like Vancouver's um, centenary or something like that. Um, and so the Chinese community put on their own event. Um, basically, they dressed up the Chinatown Vancouver's Chinatown um, into pretty much a tourist attraction, really. Um, and, uh, you know, they built this, like, their photographs, they built this, like, huge uh, pagoda, pagoda just for this event in 1936. They really kind of, yeah, again, establishing mm. the presence there, but also this really kind of tourist thing um, to bring people in the area. As again, it was, it was created as, a, you know, a ghetto, to use that term. Um, and I mean... Even throughout this time period, when I was reading my research material, you know, uh, you know, in this these discussions about revitalizing Chinatown, well, that's still happening. Um, I mean, Chinatown is kind of, especially Vancouver's here, it is in a way considered a tourist spot. You know, you tell people come to Chinatown, you uh, come to visit Vancouver, you tell them, oh, visit the Chinatown. Um, and a lot of Chinatowns kind of are like that. You know, it's just kind of like, oh, special Chinese place mm. in the city um so you feel like 
and yeah, these museums and these uh, exhibitions um, coming up, which are good for education purposes, of course. Um, um, so yeah, what is my opinion about it? What's my feeling? I guess, I guess it's, I guess what I just say, I guess it kind of is how it is. And it doesn't have to be, I guess, in the, I guess there's a kind of sense of selling out when you talk about it like that. But yeah, Chinatown has always also been kind of touristy for a while. And a lot of the, I think, a lot of places in it have been, have gone on that kind of tourist, tourist the aspect to attract people. I mean, especially now, since um, as people are probably aware, Vancouver has a very large uh, Chinese population. You know, Chinatown was once where Chinese people had to live. Now mm. they're all over Vancouver. So Chinatown's not the center of the Chinese community anymore, really, as it was before. So right. in a way, it kind of just kind of gets that point that really, especially people who are not connected to Chinatown, to come, come back almost in a sense. So. I feel like it's somewhat inevitable and it's, I mean, really is happening already. Right. Um, I'd like to uh, give the floor to Clint, who has a question for you. I have a quick question for you. Um, th there's a reason, well, I, I think there are many, many um, uh, people here who are either um, immigrants to the country or our parents were. <clears throat> I'm one. And I asked this question from that sort of perspective. Um, with some immigrant communities to Canada, especially to Canada, um, I, I, I speak from personal experience, you know, Eastern European. Um, when after the Second World War and in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, um, immigrants arrived from the home country um they were fascinated no they were blown away uh by how vibrant immigrant communities were here in canada um uh there was this notion when people and in many cases back then when they literally got the, got off the boat um oh my gosh there's so many of my people here. Uh, and that was a fascination for these newcomers because in many cases, and this is quite awful, um, they were told by the authorities back home that there are very, very few people of your nationality abroad. Oh, interesting. Uh, now, did you from your research and and um you know jim wong Chu's creativity and poetry did he did you ever get the notion that he met people who had that sort of shock that sort of experience it's like oh oh my gosh i can go into a part of town which exists for better or for worse um, where I can speak my language, there's a zillion of my former country people here. Did you ever get any of that vibe? It's 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 something that happens ha, has been happening. I found 80s, 90s, you know, repressive regimes finally let their people out, and they were always told, oh, you, you can't go abroad because you'll lose your culture, your language, you'll never be able to communicate with anybody. Any yeah, that's a really great, that's a really great question, Clint. Um, I think, um, I mean, I think in general, with Chinese Canadian history, I mean, of course, Chinese Canadians, Chinese people weren't the only uh, group, you know, immigrating to Canada very early on. But you know, again, of course, they've been immigrating, Chinese individuals have been immigrating to Canada since uh, the 1860s uh, in a in a large or in a large large scale way, so yeah. I think and you know even the immigrants who came over here, you know of course a lot of times in the beginning you know uh, you know it's for economic reasons so of course it was you know you make your riches in in Canada the gold rush and stuff and then uh, return right. with that money back to China um, so I so yeah that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting comment I feel like I would suppose you know. 
Chinese people had always known people were in Canada. I mean, there's so many people, there's so many Chinese immigrants here. And I mean, they started talking about this place called Gold Mountain, which was B Vancouver, which was BC, because that was where the gold right. rush was. So they, yeah. they knew there was this place and they knew people were going over there and they were um, yeah, I mean, even, even in the mid 19th century, like you said, repressive, repressive regime, uh, you know, the Qing dynasty was, a uh, it's not doing very well at the time. It was right. out of a lot of reason why Chinese individuals were leaving the country for better opportunity. So, so there's that. And I mean, yeah, again, like I think, of course, people I'm sure found a lot of comfort in that other Chinese individuals were here already. And like I said, they formed societies that were literally based around the kind of organizational familial structures they had back in China already. So like you said, they could find their fellow country people, literally, quite literally. Um, and, you know, that just helped just the fact that they were so highly, of course, discriminated against in that period. Um, and uh, yeah, turned around by the turned back by the dominant society. So, yeah, I think there's definitely that sense of like, um, and to the culture part, I think there's definitely yeah a sense of like, of course, the Chinese Canadian activism was all about keeping, uh, you know, this culture here, and especially in mm -hmm. of course, there's so many Chinese in individuals here, and you know, to keep that culture, but also to explore, you know new possibilities, how, what being Chinese, you know, being born Chinese in Canada, like myself, you know, very different experience than, um, you know, my parents were born in Hong Kong, came over here though at a very early age, but, you know, they're my grandparents being more comfortable speaking in Chinese. So, you know, they would, so they would have to speak in Chinese to them. And I don't really know Chinese because <laughs> I, my parents are, fluent in English, so I didn't really need to do that. So, so that kind yeah. of stuff, I, yeah, so, so, yeah, so I guess, I don't know, I, I guess I, I, get, speak. I get the impression, Brendan, that the lines of communication, even in the late 1800s and throughout the decades, um, you know, your uncle or your cousin or your brother could come over to North America and specifically Canada, BC, Gold Mountain, and do well and spread the word and say something like, you know what, this is a pretty good place, you know, to make a bit of money to send back yeah. home. And yeah, those, exactly. it seems to me that those lines of communication um, for the time certainly weren't suppressed by the authorities. Um, I, certainly, I, I don't think you, you want your population leaving en masse, but still, um, you know, there wasn't that sort of false information that, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. if you're in Hong Kong, Beijing, Shanghai, whatever, oh, there's, there's no shame. There's no Asian people. There's no Chinese people in North America. Why go? You'll be lonely. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I don't think I, I get the sense that 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 was never really put out there to scare people to sort of keep. Yeah, them I mean, uh, maybe someone in the audience has a better answer than me, like uh, someone who's more of a historian. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, I guess I guess not. I mean, I guess uh, I mean, you know, Qing Dynasty China as well. They were very much under the influence of foreign the foreign powers at the time. So, yeah, and maybe maybe they didn't have. They just they wouldn't have been able to stop that kind of immigration on mass in that sense uh, and what the kind of what you're talking about but yeah certainly like you said there was a lot of a lot of communication between the communities here um and back in china uh, even and even into the period when chinese immigration was excluded into canada so certainly yeah people knew yeah exactly yeah yeah exactly like this was gold mountain this was a place to there are other Chinese individuals here. This is there's better better opportunities. Um, actually, actually, in fact, um, especially for the building of the CPR, um, you know, agents from North America, how they how they built the CPR was um, how they got Chinese labor was that they uh, create these these gangs of Chinese laborers basically. So they have agents from the railway company like going to to China and like advertising, like, hey, we got this job over here in North America, like you should come over. So they're actually, yeah, they were, they were 
inviting people to come over. Mm-hmm. In a sense. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, a, there's a great monument, there's a great tribute uh, just by the Sky Dome to that here in Toronto. Really? Uh, the railway workers, yeah. It's I, you know, like in a little subtle, but eh, whatever. I, um, is that the one where we're uh, right by Union Station by the tracks? No, it's it's due west of 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 um, pardon me, Rogers Center. Um, I'm old fashioned. I still call it Sky Dome. Uh, I, right. I still call it the thing that the people who paid for it named it. <laughs> thank you, uh, Naomi. Naomi Sawada is wishing uh, good night uh, and thank you, Brandon, uh, for your presentation. I'll be signing off now. Uh, looking thank you forward so much, Naomi. to the Enjoy. recording. Okay, uh, sorry to cut you off there. Just want to make sure I get a, I get a couple of comments in. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a comment from uh, Robert Yip. Uh, thank you. Uh, he's saying that in 1936, 1936 was 50 years after Vancouver's incorporation, so it was a golden uh, jubilee. Golden jubilee, yeah, that's what it was. That's what I was trying to remember. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Megan has another question. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe we should start charging Megan. What, what do you think is good? Twenty-five bucks per word. Megan says. Um, Me- Megan is asking. Uh, sorry, one more question. Sorry, Megan. I thought I'd make a joke. Uh, in Vancouver, we have several prominent Chinese Canadian academics. We think of Andy Yan and Henry Yu, for example, who have been active in Chinatown community building projects and initiatives. As you move through your work and career, do you have a sense of what role researchers, academics, historians can or should play in going in ongoing community projects outside of our university and specialist uh, circles? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, um, you know, like a part of my whole presentation was kind of set on as a, um, you know, the fact that a lot of it important, you know, community is very important, of course. And yeah, a lot of this work gets done first in uh, academic settings. And then it's the work to bring that out, um, bring that out uh, into you know, the real kind of the world of the public, um, uh, of course. So, yeah, I think you know it's the community is really where it's where it's at. Of course, it's to they they're the ones with the stories, and the history, and the memory. Um, a lot of you know researchers, of course, have a, a kind of task and a responsibility to, I think, um, you know, especially in a topic like this, you know, seek out such individuals and you know just um, you know like people now telling telling us telling me about their own memories of. Chinatown, or you know, their own knowledge is like you know, fantastic, of course, and just builds up the knowledge, uh, not for uh, for people here, for the general consciousness. Um, so, I mean, yeah, as a work between you know these people are doing the research between the community. Uh, I know Henry Yu had worked on the Chinese Canadian Museum that I mentioned earlier, so there there's an example of that of uh, you know research, academic work being formed into a into uh, <clears throat> something a little bit more accessible outside academic circles. Kind of part of why I created that Google My Map. Um, it's something, you know, not everyone's going to read the 80 page thesis. So something a little bit more tangible and something, you know, more relatable for people to flip through than reading a bunch of uh, academic stuff, which is not for everybody. Certainly not for me sometimes still. <laughs> Thanks again, Megan. Really great questions. All right. Uh, we have one question from Stanley uh, Chia. Uh, great job, Brandon. Do you think Jim uh, would have liked the Dragon, the Fire Dragon Festival we had in Vancouver, Chinatown uh, last year? Oh, yeah. I saw that. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I did message him in the chat there. I really think, I think he would have. It was really great. It was really fun. Um, it was too bad. It was kind of it was kind of centered in this courtyard area where the co- cultural center is. You know, from the picture I saw in uh, Jim's album, uh, it looked they were going up. Kind of looked like they were going up the street along Pender Street or something. So it got pretty crowded in that courtyard pretty quickly. <laughs> so um, been cool if like yeah, cool if it went down the street and been more space. I don't. But uh, I'm sure there were reasons for it, but I think he would have loved it. It was really great. And it was great that it actually happened again. 
So all I heard was like, that was the only time it happened. And then lo and behold, it happens again, finally. It was a really fun time, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, great. All right, well, uh, thank you, Brendan. And again, I would like to offer you a big round of applause. I mean, wow. Um, no wonder you won the award. Um, so oh, thank you yeah. so much. Uh, I think uh, Ashley Cook, who is our awards officer, uh, is still uh, in attendance. Uh, Ashley, um, can I bug you to speak a little bit more about uh, the award and the process uh, through which it is awarded uh, to the most or to the best and most brilliant thesis uh, in the FEPCM program? Or not. Or not. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to uh, catch you there, of, of, of course. Um, sure, I'll hear from Ashley soon <laughs> anyway. All right, well, the question is out there. Um, but um, this is fantastic. Um, Chinatowns, in my experience, I've, I've, I've done a bit of traveling, not, not many places, but, but far away. And Chinatowns, uh, wherever they are, they are this center of gravity. And they're both, right? They are uh, exploited in a, in, in a marketing sort of touristy, right, attraction. Uh, I had the pleasure of, of going and, and living close to Chinatown uh, in Kobe, uh, Japan. And the associations there um, are very active. And yeah, it's, it's still, you know, the main drag is quite touristy. But uh, once you move out into, into the side streets, uh, it's, it's less of a, of a touristy place. And uh, you get to have all these different experiences. Uh, here in Toronto, uh, the existing Chinatown we have now is not where it it was founded originally. Yeah, uh, I, it was. Yeah. It, it was. It was. Uh, as many of you know, it was uprooted uh, so that city hall could be built. Right? Yeah, and then it was yeah. put somewhere else. But yeah. I think it was split because we do have at least two different China, Chinatowns in Toronto. Do you? Uh, did, did you become familiar with that? And are there any parallels to Chinatown in in Vancouver or or other Chinatowns that you have uh, been to? Um. Yeah, I mean, when you read about Chinatowns, there are, there is a lot of parallels. I mean, there's, I mean, my, pic my picture here. If I move my head, the gate, the gate. There's always a a function mm. <laughs> of a lot of Chinatowns. And again, again, like yeah, like part of that tourist thing. I mean, a lot of Chinatowns, you know, especially since they be kind of a lot of them, you know, took on this concept of Chineseness. They're like um, trying to show this sense of Chineseness. It was like this. This mm -hmm. Chinese community in the area, you know, incorporate a lot of architectural elements. So, and of course, since they went back in history so far, that you know, a lot that you might you know refer to as Chinese or Asian in some sense. Um, so, I mean, again, yeah, was, there are a lot of parallels, definitely, in how they look, how they function. You know, benevolent mm -hmm. clan societies um, everywhere. Um, Victoria uh, on the island again has a. <clears throat> very well-known Chinatown, quite small, but it's the actually it's the oldest Chinatown in Vancouver. There's a lot of the immigrants when they came over, they were landed in Victoria since it was the it is the capital of BC. Still, is older. It's older than Vancouver. So, yeah, a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of parallels. I know about Toronto. I know about the story of that. It used to be where City Hall was, and then was moved over, and that was this whole political mm. thing of course oh and, and before it was chinatown uh, as 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 itself it was that was pretty much where all the immigrants landed in the mm. 19th century yeah right so it was it was a very uh, neglected area by the city right it was uh, sanitation was poor all these things mm -hmm. uh, the landlords were literally slum lords mm -hmm. um, and uh, all that the area encompassed around you know uh, the hospital for six for sick children Right, uh, City Hall, and uh, on on uh, Elizabeth Street, uh, back in back in those days. Uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. I would like to uh, invite any any final questions. We've got a couple of minutes left. Clint, so you know, um, I've just been uh, texting with uh, Ashley. Um, I've got the information here on on oh, the board. Just uh, great folks, um, especially people uh, who are currently or plan on being registered at Ryerson. Um, uh, 
in in the master's program um, should uh, should uh, definitely check this out. We PHSC we offer a number of awards, and one of them is is called the Ryerson University Thesis Prize. It's an annual award of you know a not insignificant amount of money, um, and a promise to publish. Um, and it's given to the best master's thesis by a student enrolled in the photographic and film pres preservation and collection management program at Ryerson. Uh, the winning thesis demonstrates writing skill, which our current recipient has, and presents innovative research into Canadian, into photographic history with some, we would prefer Canadian content, context or connection that is of value, but not necessarily mandatory. So please be aware of this, folks. Um, um, it's uh, it's a chance to publish. It's a chance for you know, a couple of bucks and an opportunity to speak um, in front of a group such as this. So that answers your question, Celio. I hope uh, it's it's what I probably should have mentioned at the beginning of the talk, but uh, now we know. Oh, I think your sound's off, Celio. Probably we can't hear you, buddy. See, naturally, see, see, like all of our budget goes to these awards, right? Doesn't go to, <laughs> doesn't go to the tech. So I, I just want to make sure that that our uh, audience members today uh, understand the importance of this award um, for our society uh, and and how we, you know the the, the importance that we uh, give to emerging uh, researchers, historians uh, of photography. Uh, to find, uh, to support them in the research uh, and in their telling of these uh, largely unknown stories of histories of photography. And uh, I want to congratulate Brandon for a truly exceptional uh, piece of work, uh, excellent writing, uh, a, a very, I mean, it's evidenced by today's lecture, uh, how influential um, uh, the, the the figure that you focus on is was and will be for uh, Vancouverites, especially uh, in Chinatown, uh, but also the significance and the impact that your work uh, has for the community. So that being mm -hmm. said, I'd like to again offer you one more time, you know, my deep uh, deepest felt congratulations and a round of applause. Woohoo! All right, thanks so All much. Right. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody who came. We will now wrap up the uh, presentation. I will stop recording.